Good morning. Good morning. As I was uh, in Cincinnati, I realized we needed to reinstitute our opening prayer, interfaith prayer here. So as an affirmation for peace in the Middle East and in solidarity with our Muslim and Jewish brothers and sisters, all of us, people of the book, we greet one another. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. Shalom. So as most of you know, I'm Reverend Vicki Elder. Glad to be back. Yay. <laughs> it's always great to go and it's always great to come back. That's a, that's a good place to be in life, right? <laughs> so it is my joy and honor to welcome you to Unity of Monterey Bay, a beloved community co-created with love and intention that welcomes all people, all races, ages, cultures, ethnic backgrounds, economic circumstances, nationalities, and religions. Whatever your immigration status, sexual orientation, gender identity, family configuration, and or abilities, whether you're here with us in person or joining us virtually, we know that love knows no boundaries. We are one in spirit. As a purpose-driven church, Unity of Monterey Bay is an inclusive spiritual community committed to co-creating an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just, and compassionate human presence on this planet. We celebrate our oneness and honor the God of each of our understanding, affirming the innate good and divine essence within each and every individual. Would you please join me in our statement of faith? There is only one presence and one power in the universe, God the good, expressing as infinite God beyond us, intimate God beside us, inner God being us, divine love in action. Before we pray this morning, I want to acknowledge all the veterans within our community. Will all the veterans stand up, please? I know we have a few in here. And I also want to share, which is never really a, a uh, unexpected surprise, but uh, our own James Bogan was acknowledged uh, 
in a resolution brought by District 1 Supervisor Luis Alejo, honoring by the Monterey Board of Su Supervisors, along with three other veterans, for their distinguished service, not only in the armed forces, but also in their service to Monterey County and the broader community. So we give thanks for James. We know that he doesn't just bless our community, but he blesses the, the veterans and disabled veterans. So we thank you for your service, James. And so as we honor our veterans today, as well as take a stand for peace in the Middle East and in Ukraine and wherever else conflict is present, including within our own nation's government, I share this prayer that uh, Michelle found called Today I Am Taking Sides by Rabbi Erwin Keller. Today I am taking sides. I am taking the side of peace. Peace, which I will not abandon even when its voice is drowned out by hurt and hatred, bitterness of loss, cries of right and wrong. I am taking the side of peace, whose name has barely been spoken in this winterless war. I will hold peace in my arms and share my body's breath, lest peace be added to the body count. I will call for de-escalation, even when I want nothing more than to get even. I will do it in the service of peace. I will make a clearing in the overgrown thicket of cause and effect so peace can breathe for a minute and reach for the sky. I will do what I must to save the life of peace. I will breathe through tears. I will swallow pride. I will bite my tongue. I will offer love without testing for deservingness. So don't ask me to wave a flag today unless it is the flag of peace. Don't ask me to sing an anthem unless it is a song of peace. Don't ask me to take sides unless it is the side of peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so breathing into this moment of inner truth and gratitude, we affirm together, thank, thank you, you God, God for this most, most amazing day. day. Miracle, miracle follows miracle. miracle. And, and wonders, wonders never, never cease. cease. Well, I understand that we missed birthdays last week, mm -hmm. so we don't want to forget about the November birthday, so we're going to do birthday celebration today. So all the November birthdays, you want to come up front. And if you weren't here in your month of, of birthdays and didn't get to do that, you're also welcome to come on up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My son's birthday was last Sunday. That's where I was with him. My sister's <laughs> birthday is this, this November. Yeah, all right. So we hold our loved ones. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, your wonderful to you. God is blessing you now. God is blessing you now. God is blessing. And now, as we do every week, it's time to both celebrate and pray for our children, those in our spiritual community, in our families, in the larger community, all the children in the world, especially those suffering in wars and conflict, as well as the inner child within each of us. We hold all children in our hearts and we see them protected and resilient, creative and evolving, joyous and loved as we join in our heartfelt blessing. We love you, we bless you, we appreciate you just the way you are. This bright light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This bright
So now let's all take a deep breath in, let it out with an audible sigh. <sighs> As we center ourselves to embrace this blissful interconnection with spirit and invite the chime to call us into this sacred space within. We ring the chime four times to call in the four directions and remind us of our interconnection with all of creation and with the sacred circle of life. As we feel it resonate through our very beings, we follow its call into this now present moment within. Continuing to focus on our breath, with each inhale, we open our hearts and minds. We envision our breath reaching every cell of our being. And with each exhale, we see all barriers and obstacles dissolving into this divine flow. Again, as we inhale, we expand the spaciousness within us. We move beyond the limitations and boundaries of our bodies. And as we exhale, we ground ourselves deep within Mother Earth and into our oneness with the universe. Finally, we breathe our awareness into the highest expression of love, light, joy and peace we can imagine as we experience a transforming wave of gratitude and with a fullness of heart we say yes to it all embracing claiming and knowing that through and as us and with a final exhale we say thank you god now fully centered and transformed by the power of spirit we enter into our lesson and meditation time with today's daily word We read from the November 11th Daily Word, shared with permission of Unity Publisher of Daily Word, that can also be found at dailyword.com. And the word is service. I invite you to allow my words to be your words. I give thanks for those who serve. There are many who place others' needs ahead of their own, who sacrifice their time, even their lives, in service to others. I honor these individuals, those who are still with us, as well as those who have passed on. No matter the form their service takes, I am grateful for their willingness to give the best of themselves. I am mindful their efforts help afford me freedoms and privileges I enjoy. I bless those who serve when I pray for their safety and protection. I see them as divinely guided endowed with the strength, wisdom, and power of the divine. I pray that I will be inspired by their example as I am called to make the world a better place. And from the scriptures, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Heaven is 
witness to the wisdom of the many paths to the sacred. We read from four sacred traditions on this morning's topic, <laughs> the sacred table. From Buddhism, spend time with your food. Every minute of your meal, people have the time and the opportunity to sit down and enjoy a meal like that. We are very fortunate. From Hinduism, do not give food only to worthy people, but give it also to strangers. Turn no one away from your house, for what you give is what will be returned to you. From Judaism, so the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And from Christianity, and just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Luke chapter 22, verses 29 and 30. Love is alive in the space between us. Feel that love right now. God speaks out in the words between us. Hear those words right now. I am holy.
between us love is alive in the space between us love is alive between us Now I'm on. Okay. This past week, I was talking on the phone with my dad, who lives in Boston, outside of Boston. And now that he's retired, <laughs> my dad's life seems to revolve almost entirely around their church. He's been the chief financial officer for something like 10 years, and instead of stepping down, he's now going to become the vice moderator, which is, we call it president of the board, right? We don't have a vice. We're not, this it's, is a big church that he goes to. My stepmom teaches Sunday school, and when I, whenever I call my dad, all he wants to talk about is church. I'm like, thanks, Dad. That's what I do all day. <laughs> so we were talking the other day. We were talking about church as usual, and he was saying how there's like a, con there's always some sort of a controversy at, you know, at any big church probably, right? There's a controversy at his church right now because historically their church has not allowed alcohol on their campus. And as a result, oh, what a surprise, they can't get people to book weddings there because they wouldn't be able to serve alcohol. So we were talking about the irony of that since we all know that Jesus drank wine, right? And I mentioned to him that, in fact, Jesus' first miracle was to turn the water to wine at the wedding at Cana. So that got me thinking about the wedding at Cana. This is the way things evolved for me. <laughs> I was thinking about that first miracle that Jesus performed, and I decided to um, look up the story and see if there was something there that I might turn into a sermon. First, I had to reread the story, which is found in the second chapter of the Gospel of John. And it comes after, in the first chapter, John the Baptist has recognized Jesus as the chosen one, as the Son of God, the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And after Jesus has begun calling his disciples, and at this point he has called Andrew and Simon Peter, Nathaniel and Philip. So the story goes that on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, apparently quite near to Nazareth. And the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus was there with this. So in the middle of the wedding, or the wedding feast, not the wedding, but the, in the middle of the feast, the wine runs out. And Jesus' mother goes to Jesus and tells him, they have no more wine. And Jesus responds to her saying, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Nevertheless, Jesus' mother tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. So there were six stone water jars there that were used for the Jew Jewish purification rites. And each of them held 20 to 30 gallons of water. So Jesus tells the servants, fill these jars with water. And the servants go and fill the jars to the brim. Then Jesus says to them, now draw some out and take it to the person in charge of the banquet. So they do that. And when the person in charge of the banquet tastes the water, he sees that it is indeed wine, but he doesn't know where it came from. So he calls the bridegroom over and says to him, and this is the famous line we've all heard, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have saved the best wine until now. I believe that's where we get the saying, save the best for last. And the chapter ends by saying that what Jesus has done here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. 
So as I began to explore the different ways that this story has interpreted, I found, as usual, that there are many, many different interpretations and different ideas about what the story means and what it is meant to teach us. Some say that this story of Jesus turning the water into wine at the wedding at Cana is important because it is Jesus' first miracle, in the Gospel of John at least, right? And it represents the beginning of his public ministry. It's sort of his coming out miracle. (laughs) Where's John? (laughs) Others point to the part in the story where Jesus' mother, who interestingly is not named, tells Jesus that the wine has run out, and Jesus says to her, it is not yet my time. So there's a lot of you know, speculation about why does he say this? What does he mean by that? Is he reluctant to begin his ministry? And why does he ultimately end up changing his mind and performing the miracle? Was he influenced by his mother and decided that it was, in fact, his time? No one knows for sure, but there's no um, lack of speculation and different possibilities about what can For those who say that it is the first of his miracles and the beginning of his ministry, it seems strange to me in that case that when his mother tells him the wine has run out, Jesus hesitates to get involved. He certainly doesn't seem like he's ready for his big coming out miracle. Nor does he seem to want to make any big production out of it or to cause a big scene. In fact, most people at the wedding didn't even know the miracle happened. And yet he decides to perform the miracle. And a a Jewish wedding in in first century Palestine at which the wine has run out would be a disaster for sure, as the wedding feast was most likely meant to go on for days. So perhaps Jesus simply can't bear to see the festivities ruined. Here's another possibility. Now, the text doesn't say this, but um, I've... You know, all the various things I've read, I've come across this um, particular understanding that the wedding actually may have been the wedding of Jesus' sister, Salome, which would explain why Jesus' mother was there, right? In that case, running out of wine early in the festivities would reflect poorly on the family. So maybe Jesus was simply trying to prevent embarrassment or ruined reputation. Or... Maybe Jesus was just a young man who couldn't say no to his mother. Who knows why he decides to do it, but it seems to me that Jesus is not grandstanding. This is not the big rollout of his ministry. Certainly, it's a pretty quiet miracle if that was to be his first. He simply sees a need and decides to help out. Now, another issue to consider when interpreting this story is what a miracle actually is or what it represents in the story. Now, interestingly, I was surprised to find out that the word miracle in in the original language is not found anywhere in the Bible. What we call miracles are actually something more akin to signs or acts of power or work. Now, I think this distinction can be helpful when we're considering these miracles or signs that Jesus performs in the Gospels, because a miracle, as we understand it, right, requires a suspension of disbelief, right? A miracle, in our understanding, is something that we have no explanation for, right? Something supernatural, something magic, something that is outside of the known laws of the universe, On the other hand, a sign or an act of power, it seems to me, does not require the same suspension of belief. A sign or an act of power, rather than something that is um, functioning outside of the laws of the universe, is actually more like um, an effective demonstration of those laws. For example, it might be a demonstration of abundance or of provision. We just don't fully understand the laws, and so we call it a miracle. Now, this would be much more in line with unity's understanding of miracles, am I right? 
And we often talk about miracles as a shift in perspective. Now, surely it would require a shift in perspective to be able to use the laws of the universe in the way that Jesus did. And we also take seriously the verse in chapter 14 of the Gospel of John where Jesus says that we will not only do the things that he has done, but will also do even greater things. So this means that the things Jesus does are not magic. They're not supernatural. He's simply using the laws of the universe in a way that we have not quite figured out yet how to. (laughs) But in his own words, when and if we do figure it out, we will do even greater things than he did. Another question to look at is whether Jesus performs the miracle of turning the water to wine all by himself or whether the other participants in the story have a role to play. Now, notice that Jesus doesn't sort of wave his hands over the water jugs, you know, abracadabra. He doesn't do something dramatic like that, some special incantation, you know. He simply tells the servants to fill up the the jugs with water and then to draw some out. Do the servants then have a part in the miracle if they are the ones who drew the water out? Maybe did they actively believe that the water was going to be wine and using the law of mind action, they somehow helped to bring this miracle about? And what about the man in charge of the feast that they give the first cup to, the one who tasted the wine and declared that it was the best wine that had been saved for last? Does his belief play a role? These are interesting questions because it would not be the first or the only place that Jesus sort of waves away his role in the miracles or the healings that he performs. Okay, He often downplays his own role and or gives credit to the other person for their faith. You might recall the story of the woman who had been hemorrhaging for many years. She sees Jesus in the crowd and she says to herself, if only I will but touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And so she does, in fact, reach out and touch the hem of Jesus' garment, and she is instantly healed. And do you remember what Jesus says to her? Your faith has made you well. So it's clear that the person on the receiving end of the miracle or the healing has an important role to play. Their belief in Jesus' ability, their belief in God's goodness, somehow allows that sign or act of power to be done through them. Another interpretation of the story that I really like is that the turning of the water into wine at Cana is a story about God's willingness to provide for us. One commentator read that this story reminded him of the children's story, Stone Soup. If you recall that, they start out with just a pot of water And by the end, they have this abundant soup. And so in the same way, the story of the wedding at Cana begins with emptiness and ends in abundance. And in this way, the story may be about God's providence and the way in which God is able to transform our emptiness into celebration and feasting. As I mentioned, there were six jars of water, and each contained 20 to 30 gallons of water. So the amount of water that had become wine would have been about 150 gallons. That's quite a lot of wine. So some folks feel that that extravagant amount of wine that was provided is a metaphor for God's extravagant grace and the overabundance of God's love. In this way, the story might remind us of the parable of the prodigal son. Remember how the wayward son returns and the father really goes overboard in welcoming him and celebrating him, giving him a fine cloak and a ring, throwing a huge feast and killing the fatted calf. So each of these stories may be, at least in some way, metaphors for God's extravagant love and mercy. All of these are reasonable interpretations of the story. And as always, there is never any one right way to understand the story. As with all Bible stories, there is all kinds of speculation about what the author's intention may have been. And the best that we can do with that is to make an educated guess. 
But the most important meaning of the story is always the one. When we're trying to interpret Bible stories to see what they might mean to us and what value they may have for us today, the meaning that is most valuable for us is a personal one. And this often tends to be the one that sort of leaps out at us, right? Like if you get a hit, like, oh, you know, there may be a point in your exploration of the story where you go, bingo, that's it. I've, you know, that's, that's the meaning for me. And so this happened to me when I was reading these various interpretations. I knew instantly that I had hit upon the meaning that I wanted to seize on and the reason that I felt I had been called to speak about this story today in the first place. In this particular way of interpreting the story, the wedding at Cana isn't important just because it's Jesus' first miracle. It's important also, or mainly, because Jesus thought that a small wedding in a dusty rural village filled with common people who were mostly uneducated and illiterate, unsophisticated people, Jesus thought that this was the proper venue for his first miracle. A wedding feast in a small village is such a normal, everyday, common human gathering. A place where people come together to celebrate, to be with one another, to break bread together, to laugh and just enjoy the simple pleasures of life. And the central element of any feast is the table. Now, if you look up the word table in the revealing word, which is um, our dictionary of metaphysical definitions of common words, we see that table represents the very foundation of our being. So the table is the very foundation of our being. It is where we gather daily for nourishment, for sustenance. It is the most basic of human elements. And if we think about it, If we think back, we'll start to realize that many of the most important stories about Jesus, not perhaps the parables he told, but the stories about the things he did, many of them take place at tables when gathered around a common meal. The most obvious example is the Last Supper. But there's also the story of the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with oil. Disciples were gathered at table. And then there is the time that the resurrected Christ appears to the disciples again while they are gathered at table over a common meal. This is where the the disciples see that Jesus is still with them in a way that they haven't yet been able to wrap their brains around, right? But there he is, joining them at table. Why do you suppose so many of Jesus' miracles so many of his most important teachings take place around the table. Again, the table is the place where we gather daily, the place where we find connection, where we seek sustenance, both for our bodies and our spirits. The table is the central place of home life. It's where a family is formed, bonded, strengthened. It's where communication and connection and sharing and understanding take place. Think of those studies that we've all heard that have shown that children who sit down to eat with their parents have better mental health, better school outcomes, uh, less likely to get into trouble, etc. So the table is an important place, but it is also an ordinary place. And certainly for Jesus and his disciples, who were mostly not rich people and who largely depended on the kindness and hospitality of strangers, the table was a humble place. And we also know that in that part of the world, at least in Jesus' time, a table was low to the ground and you uh, reclined on cushions on the floor around the table. And so in my metaphorical way of seeing things, the table is at once a lowly place and a place of great importance. The table is both ordinary and sacred. So when these important events that are recorded in the Gospels take place at table around a common meal, 
this is what I imagine that Jesus is telling us. I imagine that Jesus is saying to us, this is where it takes place. This is where it happens. This lowly table, this place of dailiness and ordinariness is where miracles happen. It is where transformations take place. It is where there are healings and awakenings and revelations, where the ordinary becomes spiritual. Notice, not in a fancy cathedral, not on a distant mountaintop, not in some rarefied holy space, but right here at table, the place where we all gather each and every day to nourish ourselves and our loved ones. That is where the miracle happens. At the Last Supper, when they're gathered around the table, Jesus instructs his disciples to reenact a very simple ritual. When they pour the wine and break the bread, they are to do so in remembrance of him. And how often do we pour the wine and break the bread? Every day. So how often do you think Jesus wanted us to remember? Every single day in the humblest of places at table. So it's almost as if Jesus were saying, do this in remembrance of me. Not because you need a fancy ritual to determine whether you are in or out. Because remember, in the kingdom of God, Everybody's in, right? Rather, Jesus is saying, do this in remembrance of me because it is here around the table where we made magic. It is here around the table where we overcame cultural taboos in order to be able to accept at the table the stranger, the outsider, the tax collector, the adulterer, the sinner, all of Jesus' favorite people. It is here where we, re- where we connected and created something bigger than ourselves, Jesus is saying. It is here where we nourished our bodies, but mostly our spirits. And so he's saying, when you do this daily thing that you will do every day of your life, remember what we created here. Remember how it felt. Remember how you felt. And so when I'm gone, do this in order to remember. Now, Jesus didn't say, but I believe he meant, you don't need my physical presence because I won't be here for long. You can create that same radically inclusive, loving, healing, transforming table fellowship even without me. But when you pour the wine and you break the bread, remember, it will be as if I am there among you. So this is Michelle's understanding of the communion ritual. All of you hadn't figured that And so I believe it's like he's telling the disciples and telling us, remember what it felt like for us all to be together, to set aside our judgments and our differences and our social restrictions and to just be with one another. Remember that magic of the radically inclusive table because it is where the miracle happens. And so I think about our own table gatherings here at church in the fellowship hall downstairs. And I think about the feeling that I get when we are all gathered to break bread together, to share that common meal, and how it makes me feel warm and safe and happy and included. And it makes me feel that I belong to something. And I look around and I see all the people that I love, this family of choice, this community that we choose to belong to. And I see the miracles that take place there. Now, over the years, there have been certain people, sort of on the periphery of our community, folks who didn't come often, they were likely unhoused, but they seem to have a special knack for showing up whenever we were having a potluck. Do you recall? <laughs> and they would fill their plates, and they would often fill a second plate and cover it with foil to take with them. And mostly myself included, would get a little uncomfortable. 
we may have said to ourselves, I may have said to myself, why is this person who isn't really a participating member of our church and who certainly didn't bring anything to the potluck to share had somehow managed to show up on the day that there was food? <laughs> Looking back on that now, I'm somewhat ashamed of having had those feelings for my own discomfort, for my own judgment, for the fact that I was clearly missing the message of Jesus' inclusive table. This is church, not a fancy restaurant, not a country club. And I'm quite sure that when Jesus gathered with folks at table, he never once stopped to ask whether everyone had brought something whether everyone had contributed. He didn't ask questions. He simply included them. And I'm reminded of this quote that I've seen that says, we don't feed people because they deserve it, but because they are hungry. That's why you've probably noticed that I kind of have a little spiel I always give when we're having a potluck. During the announcements, I always feel compelled to say, if you didn't bring anything, come anyway, please. I don't want people to feel like, you know, that they shouldn't join us in, in our meal because they didn't bring something. I mean, God knows that there have been plenty of times over the years when I couldn't afford to bring something. Or, you know, as a single mom of a special needs child, I did not have the bandwidth to, or the energy to come up with something to bring to the potluck. So who cares? It's not what it's about. So next week, we will be having our annual Thanksgiving luncheon, and we will have an opportunity to practice this inclusive table fellowship that is the radical example that Jesus set, to gather around a table to share a feast. Such an ordinary act such an ordinary place, but a place that was important enough and sacred enough that Jesus saw fit to perform his first miracle there. And we will have an opportunity to do this in remembrance of him, to pour the wine and to break the bread in remembrance of what Jesus did, what he symbolizes, and what he taught. Also, in remembrance of the early Christians, who we know didn't meet in a church. They simply didn't, certainly didn't meet in a cathedral. They met in people's homes. And the early ministry was a ministry of table fellowship. They gathered at table. So next week, we will break bread together and we will recreate that inclusive table of love and connection and belonging. That table that is at once ordinary and sacred that table at which everyone has a place, where everyone belongs, and where we will all be fed, both physically and spiritually, not because we deserve it, but because we are hungry. And so I hope that we will all remember when we do that, that it's not just a table, and it's not just a meal, it's a miracle.
Quiet our bodies and begin to bring our minds into the present moment, listening to the sounds that are present around us, noticing the feelings that might be present in our body, feeling the weight of our body and allowing ourselves to just sink in a little deeper into the seat beneath us. Taking a deep breath in, we say to ourselves, God is here. And exhaling, I am home. Breathing in again, God is here. And breathing out, I am home. Remembering that belly breathing that we've been practicing where we Allow our belly to expand on the inhale and gently contract on the exhale. Allowing our breath to be received deep in our belly. This calms the central nervous system and brings us into the present moment. So as we settle into this now sacred present moment. Just allowing our hearts to be filled with gratitude for the many tables we get to sit at. Tables of our families and our friends. And the tables that we sit at here at church with our church family. And we become so grateful for the abundance that is such a given part of our lives. So much food, so much abundance. And so as we allow our hearts to be filled with gratitude, We settle even deeper into this presence, feeling that presence of God. That presence of the Christ. That presence of the Christ that is both within you and without you. The Christ that is in all things. the Christ that has a seat at every table. And the table will be wide, and the welcome will be wide, and the arms will open wide to gather us in, and our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust there is enough, and we will come unhindered and free, and our aching will be met with bread, and our sorrow will be met with wine. So I invite you now to just rest gently as you allow gratitude to fill your heart in the silence.
prepare to bring this time to a close now, coming back to the sensations in our body and the sounds around us, and returning to this now place and time with a greater understanding of how we can make our own table even more inclusive. And so we give thanks for these teachings, for this community that supports us, and for the steadfast, loving presence of God. And we say thank you, thank you, thank you. And so it is. Amen. Unity of Monterey Bay is the collective consciousness and commitment of all of us who give of our time, treasure, and talent in order to sustain the spiritual community that is dedicated to transforming lives. We know that prosperity is a state of mind that finds blessings in every situation and abundance. We transform all appearance of fear or lack into a faith-filled peace of mind by shifting our attention to thoughts of gratitude for the abundance of God's good in our lives. And as the ushers please come forward, I invite you to think of something specific that you are grateful for in this now moment. And now with our hearts and minds overflowing with gratitude, we breathe into the divine flow of God's good, trusting that we are enough, that we have enough, and that there always is enough to both have and to share. For those of you who give online through our website, have set up monthly auto payments from your bank, or give by credit card, we are truly grateful. And we ask that you join us in faith and gratitude as we pass the offering baskets this morning by holding and blessing the basket as it passes you. And now, please join me in our offertory blessing. I, I am, am an open, open channel, channel for God's infinite good. good. Divine love, love flowing, flowing through, through me blesses and, and multiplies everything I give and everything, everything I receive. I am both blessed and a blessing. Thank you, God.
joy that we bless and give thanks for these gifts and offerings that demonstrate our collective commitment to the spiritual work of love and transformation in our lives and in our world. We dedicate this offering, our lives, and this ministry to more fully expressing the Christ light that is the truth of our being and inviting all people to know God's love. Finally, knowing that one with God, all things are possible, we affirm together the good is now, the rest is blessed, and the best is yet to be in our lifetime. Gently. Thank you, God. So for our music today, we want to thank Lorraine nelson Wolf, Richard Burdick, and Denise Rosier, as well as our awesome music team with Denise and Sue and John and Marianne and Robin and Rayleigh today, singing a little bit with us and myself. <laughs> Yay! So um, for announcements, check the eblast and the save the dates handout that um, there's still some of back there. Our potluck Thanksgiving luncheon obviously is next week and there are signups in the sacred ground. At this point, it looks like we, what? I just left. Oh. This computer. Oh, yeah, yeah. It has a, yeah, it's a different version. We sometimes get little glitches. It looks like we are still short a toiki. Anybody want to bring a swaky? <laughs> yeah, that's one. I can hold one myself. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. If you're interested in bringing a turkey or even just a turkey breast, that would be great. Um, but, you know, whatever you want to bring, um, go ahead and sign up in there. And then, okay, this week it's actually correct to say that our holiday bazaar will begin next week. <laughs> I've said that the past two weeks in a row because I know. I knew it was wrong, but I just... The week after the week next. After Again? <laughs> after Thanksgiving. Okay, I'm just reading the script here, folks. Yeah. After Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving. After. After. The, okay. All right. All right. Fire me. Just fire me. Get one of those big hooks and just yank me off the stage. So you can start bringing things in to um, contribute to the holiday bazaar, which will begin the following week. All right. Also, there are poinsettias available for purchase if you would like to um, dedicate a poinsettia in someone's honor, and that is also in the sacred ground. All right. As we bring our service to a close this morning, we are so grateful that you have joined us, whether you're here in person or you're joining us um, on Facebook or later on on YouTube. We hope we've made you feel at home in our community, and we want you to know that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Our chaplain on duty today is Miss Robin. She's available to pray with you after the service, so we give thanks for that, as well as the service of all of our prayer chaplains who are always holding the high watch for our community. Let's form our closing circle. <laughs> And choir practices right after oh, the service. Choir too. practice yeah. for anyone that <laughs> is interested in singing come on Thanksgiving, us. right? Yep. If you've never next joined week. the choir before, it doesn't matter. Just come, right? Yes. Yep. Yes. <laughs> All right, y'all have to come this way a little bit. <laughs> All right, so 
let's recall that um, opening prayer that we had today about choosing the side of peace mm -hmm. and holding the world and all of the places that are in conflict right now in this circle of peace and love and just seeing God's love there in the midst of it all. So as we say the prayer for protection, let's direct it towards those areas that need it most. <laughs> the, the light, light of God, God surrounds, surrounds us. us. I am light. The, the love of God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. The presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well.